Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, November Restoring Neighborhoods Task Force webinar. We are excited for uh, today's presentation. We have some uh, wonderful presenters, um, and so we're going to hop right into that. Um, before we get started, we are going to just move through a few brief things. Um, we have some updates from NHC, um, so I will start those now. Uh, the first of which is that we want to remind everyone who's tuning in to register for our upcoming Solutions for Affordable Housing convening. This is our annual policy convening focused on solutions to a number of uh, problems facing the housing industry today. We have panels that are set for um, issues like rent control, um, climate impact, ending homelessness. Uh, so we're really excited to have a, a number of experts uh, joining us uh, in December uh, to, to discuss these issues um, and some solutions to look at moving forward. Um, register today using the code SAVE10 and you can get a uh, discount on your registration fee. Um, additionally, we have another webinar that's coming up next week. Uh, this is a webinar through our Emerging Leaders in Affordable Housing program. Um, so this is a program that we run for uh, you know, housers or people in the industry uh, age 30 and under, and this webinar is going to be on racial justice and community development. Um, so we have some two awesome presenters that are going to be joining us, um, both of ELA age, and we hope that if you have any folks in your um, uh, in your organization that are 30 or under, or you yourself are 30 and under, that you will um, join us for that. So uh, I'll put my contact info up at the end of the presentation. Please reach out if you have questions about um, that webinar and the ELA program. Um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to David Dorkin, our president and CEO here at the National Housing Conference. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking everybody for being on the call and particularly thank Bob um, for joining us. Um, Bob is a senior leader at Fannie Mae, and he, have, I have, he and I have worked together for many years, and uh, he is as genuine and expert on this area as well as others that we're going to get. So. Thank you for joining us. And um, I also wanted to just put in a plug on two things. One is that, as many of you know, we're drafting a National Housing Act. Um, we haven't had a truly National Housing Act, comprehensive National Housing Act since 1968. I'm actually looking at the signing pen on my wall right now. It's time to get another one. Um, we have just so many um, diverse problems in our housing system that we need to fix and we want you all to be a part of that. Um, so talk to Nathan, send him a note about how you can get involved in drafting the National Housing Act for the 21st century. And then finally, I wanna put in another plug for solutions. You do not wanna miss this conference. Uh, I can't say who we're likely to get as a um, keynote address because it's not um, finalized yet. And um, the, uh, um, but it's, uh, you want to use that 10% off discount now, I guarantee it. And then, um, you know, we also have some amazing panelists, um, including Pam Pattenode, former Deputy Secretary of HUD, and Craig Phillips, who is a former Senior Advisor at the Treasury Department, who um, really led the initiatives on both CRA and uh, housing finance reform. So we, we're going to have a lot of pretty amazing um, panelists and it's going to be a really substance substance packed uh, day so um, you can do that online and uh, please make sure you're registered and uh, register a friend because we want to really have as broad a um, membership participation as possible so with that i'm not going to hold you up any longer and i'm interested in hearing um, what our panelists have to say today thanks Great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you to David and the National Housing Conference for hosting us today. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us for what I hope will be a good conversation. My name is Bob Simpson, and I'm the head of Fannie Mae's affordable rental housing and green finance business. I'm joined by Rachel Cluett, who manages our healthy housing program here and our multifamily affordable team. At Fannie Mae, we support affordable rental housing by raising money in the capital markets from investors across the world and putting those funds to work 
in properties that set aside all or a portion of units for low, very low, and extremely low income renters. We're one of the largest sources of financing for affordable housing in the United States. And last year, we invested nearly $8 billion to create, preserve, or improve affordable rental properties across the United States. These dollars are deployed to the market in two ways. One, via equity investments in our low-income housing tax credit program, but two, through a suite of affordable debt programs that we make available via a broad network of commercial real estate lenders. These dollars are deployed to the market um, in, in a way uh, that the debt programs, uh, our Healthy Housing Rewards Program, represents one of the newest additions to our suite of debt programs. And it reflects our commitment to expand the impact of our affordable housing investments. It's based on the fundamental concept that investing in affordable rental housing needs to be more than just a real estate transaction. It has to be an investment in the people who live in the building and call it home. So if we could go to the slide, Nathan, uh, that starts as, as uh, the two paths to healthy housing rewards. Is that slide up? Yep. Great. So, um, and I'm running blind here, so I, I'm not able to see the slides, so I apologize. So I'll just rely on Nathan to change slides for me. So, healthy housing rewards provides a pricing incentive that lowers the all in note rate for properties that either a, integrate healthy and active design features at their property, which is the healthy design feature, or B, offer enhanced resident services for very low income renters and their families, which is the resident services feature. In order to qualify for the program, the properties have to have at least 60% of the units that are restricted to very low income renters. And additionally, the property owner has to receive a healthy housing reward certification from an independent third party partner. In this case, for healthy design, uh, our partner is Fitwell, and for resident services, it's the core certification program uh, that has been built by the stewards of affordable housing for the future. Now, we require a certification to ensure that the properties that we are providing this incentive to are meeting a common standard that is both developed and monitored by an independent third-party partner with expertise in healthy housing activities. Uh, and we do this because our goal is just not to finance more deals with healthy housing features. We also think it's important to help the affordable housing community establish third-party industry standards for healthy design and enhanced resident services. So let's go to the next slide and start with healthy design. Right. So just to take you back to the program beginnings, the concept of incentivizing property owners to incorporate healthy design features in their projects spring from a partnership with the Center for Active Design and the Fitwell certification program that they manage. We worked with the center to expand Fitwell to include multifamily residential properties, and that certification is required for our Healthy Housing Rewards program. The incentive that we provide is a reduction of our interest rate that then provides bar borrowers with the to borrowers who incorporate design features that either improve air quality, encourage physical activity, incorporate common space, community gardens, playgrounds uh, into their newly constructed or rehabilitated affordable rental properties. Uh, as I said, we rely on Sitwell, uh, Fitwell to certify the properties uh, for the program, but Fannie Mae does reimburse property owners for the cost of certification. We can go to the next slide. So Amani Place is a 100% affordable property in Atlanta. It's an excellent example of a healthy housing rewards property that we financed and benefited from the healthy design incentive. What's great about this is the borrower, in this case, Jonathan Rose Companies, was able to pair healthy housing rewards with other Fannie Mae programs. And all of the programs that we have in our multifamily affordable debt business are designed in this way so that they can work in conjunction with each other. In this case, our MBS tax exempt bond pass through program helped the borrower obtain a lower investor spread on their tax exempt bond execution. A green rewards feature enabled them to increase proceeds by having the capacity to underwrite 
up to 75% of projected energy and water savings. And finally, the healthy design certification provided an additional 15 basis point reduction in their all-in note rate. So the approach that Jonathan Rose took to improve energy efficiency, improve indoor air quality, and also to help build infrastructure that helps residents be more active is really reflective of their long-standing commitment to green and healthy housing. They invested over $18 million to renovate the existing property uh, and improve you know, energy efficiency and or air quality uh, for the folks who now call Amani Place their home. And if we go to the next slide, you will see what Amani Place looks like today. Uh, renovations to the property were completed this fall, uh, and this is what the property looks like. You can see the community gardens, um, the walkable spaces. These are all things that are important from, a, from an active and healthy design component. We'll go to the next slide. You know, as we continue to grow this program, you know, we're always going to be looking for more ways in which we can share best practices and other resources on how borrowers can best integrate healthy design features in their property rehab or new construction. Um, it's really about, you know, the more, the more we do, the more we learn. And it's also based on the concept that all properties are different. And so there's really no one cookie cutter approach to how you build a healthy property. It depends on where the property is located, what the existing features are at that property, what do the residents need, uh, and what can the borrower uh, provide. We're also looking at the potential for additional certifications in the future. Uh, and whether or not it might make sense to expand our program, especially in terms of healthy design, to support newer mixed income properties that have affordability uh, attached to it. And having affordability attached to it is very important uh, for qualifying for this program. Great. So that's active design. If we go to the next slide, we can walk through our enhanced residence services program. So Enhanced Residence Services is the second component to our Healthy Housing Rewards Program. Now, the idea of supporting Enhanced Residence Services at affordable rental properties, uh, it's not a new idea, um, but our involvement really grew out of observing the work, uh, the research work that our partner, the Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future, did with the MacArthur Foundation when they established a framework of best practices for resident services. At the same time, in our affordable business, we were seeing a lot of affordable housing deals that included resident services. And we thought that was a great idea. But when we asked our borrowers about the programs that they were providing, they shared with us their struggle to keep them funded because oftentimes they relied on short-term grant programs or the funding simply came out of pocket from the borrower. Neither approach was sustainable over the long term, nor were they really flexible enough to always meet the needs of the residents. You know, if, they, if a grant program was to support dance programs, then the service that was being provided at the apartment was a dance program, regardless of whether or not anyone wanted to dance. So we thought we could build a program that addressed those needs, provide longer term, uh, more sustainable financing for the programs, but also built a certification program to ensure that we were meeting the needs of the residents, not meeting the needs of the grant. So our ERS program addresses those needs, number one, by relying on a certification that was built by SAFE, backed by the research that they did with the MacArthur Foundation, to ensure that the borrower or a third-party service provider has a system in place that first evaluates what the residents actually need and then has the staff and skill set to actually provide those services. The second thing that we do is we built our financial incentive for enhanced resident services into the loan in the form of a lower interest rate so that the dollar benefit lasts the life of the loan. If we go to the next slide, we can walk through an example of a recent deal to kind of show how this works. So this Healthy Housing Rewards deal is located in uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. It's actually St. Paul in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, our borrower was Common Bond Properties, uh, which is a uh, highly regarded, affordable nonprofit uh, in, the, in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area. It's an $8 million loan, a 16-year term, 
fixed rate. Once again, they benefited from taking the MBS tax exempt bond pass through product, paired it with the healthy housing rewards, enhanced resident service execution. And what we did is we had underwrote the property expenses to include the resident services. In this case, it was the coordinator, the resident service coordinator salary. And this is important because as part of this property, uh, the Minnesota Housing a State Housing Agency, with their uh, some of their subordinated debt financing, uh, had a requirement that 10% of the units had to be set aside uh, for formerly homeless families, right? So that's eight units where you needed to provide some pretty intensive supportive servicing, uh, some supportive services for folks who, who are just coming out of homelessness, right? The Healthy Housing Reward Benefit provided a pricing discount of 30 basis points off the interest rate over the life of the loan to provide funds to support those service coordinators. The savings were the equivalent of about $380,000 over the life of the loan. So that's the key thing, is this is not a program that ends in three years, it ends in 16 years. And we're committed to providing those savings over the life of the loan for those 16 years. And obviously they were able to get the core certification uh, and we cover the certification costs uh, here at Fannie Mae. So if we go to the next slide. So we obviously wanna to continue to grow this program, uh, not just to finance more deals with resident services because clearly that's what, what we want to do, uh, but also to help save housing authorities and other affordable housing leaders really develop an industry standard for resident services that will make it easier for other sources of both debt and equity capital, even our competition, um, provide financing support uh, for resident services and healthy design going forward. Uh, in, this, in the case of our enhanced resident services program, uh, we have now more than a dozen uh, organizations that have received course certification and are now eligible for Fannie Mae's Healthy Housing Rewards Financing including our first third-party uh, service provider. Um, that provides an opportunity for borrowers that have limited resident service experience to partner with a third-party partner and qualify for healthy housing rewards. Uh, SAFE has also done extensive outreach with state housing finance authorities and agencies. Uh, and actually, course certification has been included into state QAPs for Maryland and Virginia. Uh, that now uh, award preference points for organizations that have the course certification. And so we're looking forward to continuing to grow both of these programs. We think they're absolutely critical um, as we continue to address the affordable housing crisis. You know, we always think about the fact that it's not just the properties that we finance, it's the people who live in the properties that we finance. And if you really want to build a stable uh, property, a stable renter base, uh, and stable neighborhoods, uh, we need to stop thinking about rentals, uh, rental properties as, as rental units and start thinking about them as homes for families. And the more that we can do to create healthier uh, homes and provide folks with the services they need, whether it's after school programs, daycare programs, uh, smoking cessation, um, tax preparation services, you know, whatever the property needs and whatever the renters need, uh, we want to make sure that we can help provide those services to build a stronger community and a stronger property going forward. So we go to the next slide, you can see where you can get more information um, on both the certification programs, uh, as well as Fannie Mae's Healthy Housing Rewards Program. So there's some FAQs on our program. There's a flow chart to determine, you know, which way uh, you can go and, and how to go about getting these, uh, getting a property certified and, and going through our, and getting the benefit from the Fannie Mae program. Great, the next slide is uh, giving folks an opportunity for any questions. Great, thank you for that uh, presentation, Bob, that was wonderful. Um, so we are gonna head into the Q&A section um, and I see that a number of folks already have uh, entered in questions to the chat box, but for everyone that is tuning in, um, and has uh, some questions that have come up over the course of the presentation, please feel free to answer, uh, ask them into this chat box. I will then be feeding them out to both uh, Bob and Rachel. Um, so we want to you know, give you all an opportunity to, to, to engage here. Um, so I'll start with um, 
you know, uh, kind of this uh, a broader question, and Bob, you were uh, picking up in it at, at the uh, definitely at the end there. And so I just want oh, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to the um, kind of underlying underlying theory of change um, that that these programs are are kind of operating on top of. You know, what um, if you can just flesh out a bit more of why it is that you're bundling all of these um, benefits for residents together. Yeah, I think it's based on 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 two things, right? One is kind of the the more qualitative component that we simply think that it's the right thing to do. Um, we have a a mission to support affordable housing uh, in the United States, and uh, this kind of goes core to what we believe is important about affordable housing. Um, so I think that's one. I think the second is. You know, anytime you can create a situation where a person who's living in a rental property feels more stable uh, and f more financially secure and more connected to the neighborhood, um, not only does that improve the life of the person who lives there and improve the opportunities for their family, especially for their kids, it also increases the likelihood that they're going to stay in that property longer, um, that they're going to feel more a part of the community. Um, and when the community improves and when people um, you know, stay in properties longer, um, the properties tend to perform better. And so, you know, it's, it's good not only from a mission perspective in terms of improving the neighborhood, improving the lives of the people who live there in the properties, we also are operating under the, the premise that it's also good for the properties themselves. And obviously, we don't, you know, we've just started this program, so we don't have, we don't, we haven't proven that to be true. Um, but we believe it to be true, and, and we're going to put our money, but put our money behind that belief. Awesome. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of a bit, a bit of a follow up, but, but uh, you know, before this, these programs, before you were running these, I mean, what were there difficulties in trying to bring this to fruition? Was there, you know, what kind of barriers might there have been to, to starting this program? Um, if, if there were any, or was it just a matter of, of coming up with the idea and then, and then making it happen? Yeah, I think the, the, the two challenges that we faced were, were number one, figuring out how we wanted to utilize the certification. We, we, we toyed with a number of different ideas. We definitely did not want to be in the certification business ourselves because we're not the experts. Um, we couldn't tell you, um, you know, what a good resident service program looks like, but we certainly know people who, who do. Um, and I think that in the case of resident services, the stewards of affordable housing um, was really a natural fit. Uh, one, because they represent a number of affordable nonprofit uh, developers and property owners that already incorporate resident services into their properties. And so there's a wealth of experience. And the research and work that they did with the MacArthur Foundation really helped form the basis of the certification. So it was really making sure we were finding people uh, that, that, we could, that we could partner with and be independent third parties certification groups. Um, Center for Active Design on the, uh, on the healthy design side, uh, very much the same story. Their fit well certification is, was really the first of its kind in terms of supporting uh, multifamily properties, especially multifamily affordable properties uh, to encourage them to provide uh, to institute healthy design features into their buildings. And so it's really, number one, finding the right certification and then finding the best way to provide a financial benefit. And for us, it was really about what can we do to provide a benefit that survives the life of the loan. And by basically what we're doing is lowering the interest rate by taking, um, you know, providing a discount off of, off of our pricing. Um, and, and baking that into the loan so that the benefit can accrue um, over the term of the loan and not expire um, while the loan is still outstanding was very important to us. And so on, on that, uh, the note on the, the core certification, I have a, a number of folks who are just um, kind of, you know, looking for a little bit more, more uh, explanation on that. Um, I'll read this one question. I think this that kind of sums it up. Oh, it, Oh, one moment. Um, yeah, someone is asking um, for more uh, about the research process uh, to determine the criteria for core um, and what types of services would be best. 
Yeah, I think the best place to go would be the CORE's online, the CORE's online website um, has all of the answers to those questions, uh, as well as the ability to apply and, and, and determine if, and it also has a, a, a lot of information that kind of helps walk you through what is needed. Uh, and you can kind of get a good sense as to whether or not the organization uh, that you're with uh, would would qualify. Great. All right, we have another. Yeah, and I can uh, chime in on. I can chime in on that one. This is Rachel. Um, you know, I think from the perspective of stewards of affordable housing, they are really so they built out what they call a framework for resident services coordination with the support of MacArthur Foundation, and basically developed the certification and the different components that they rate organizations on in terms of their capacity to deliver high quality resident services based on kind of what they determined in that framework document. This is actually something you can get on the on the uh, Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future website. Um, but it's essentially that certification is recognizing the components uh, of an organization in terms of their experience, um, their systems that they used to provide services, their staffing model, both at the corporate level and at the property level, and evaluating that kind of as a whole package to understand um, the organization's ability to provide high quality services. Great, thank you. So here's a question about um, the, the the, you know what when you touched on the uh, homeless component so I have someone who says um, I have more homeless walk-in referrals than I do current residents can you talk a little bit more about homeless housing sure the big you know within the enhanced resident service portion um, you know like the common bond property that we talked about um, one of the features that, one of the services that, that we can help support is supportive services at the property. Uh, and so it's really, you know, if, if that, if, if, if the, if the property owner that's providing those services or the third party service organization has the ability to provide those services and can get a certification through cores, then that's, you know, having an on-site service coordinator is definitely something that we would be able to fund. Like we did with Common Bond. My guess, the real issue with the supportive services uh, is getting the right mix of, of folks coming in with supportive services versus your traditional low-income housing, uh, and being able to, to cobble together the different financing sources that you would need uh, to make that property work. Oftentimes, what we'll see on the debt side. Uh, properties that can support, uh, uh, can, you know, debt. Um, you're not seeing 100% supportive housing. There's some component of it, like what we saw in Common Bond at 10%. Uh, typically, if it's 100% or, you know, slightly less uh, percent of formerly homeless folks, we will see those deals on the tax credit equity side. But oftentimes, the financing structure won't support debt. All right, we have uh, two two different folks, both from Oregon, who have questions particular to Oregon. So hopefully, you know, maybe y'all can help out. Um, so one uh, is a question that says, are there any HHR programs um, happening in Oregon? And then the second is uh, someone from Oregon's HSA um, who wants to know how you went about working with Maryland and Virginia to incorporate uh, this program into their uh, QAP. Sure. Um, Rachel, I don't believe we have any deals in our pipeline uh, from Oregon, although I will tell you Oregon's got some amazing um, affordable housing programs and some pretty incredible partners out there. So um, uh, we would love that. We would love for whoever asked that question to be the first. Um, so not yet it's with Oregon. And then uh, in terms of uh, working with the state qualified allocation plans, I, I, and that's a really where the folks from the stewards of affordable housing for the future uh you know met with maryland and virginia um walked them through what the course certification was and um and and made sure that we figure out where it made sense uh, 
I know that there have been other additional meetings with other HFAs. I think that you know a lot of HFAs have QAPs that focus on resident services. I think what Maryland and Virginia wanted to do is kind of build some, you know, set some more defined standards around what resident services actually means. And so I, I would say uh, on the Oregon side, um, please feel free to reach out to Rachel or myself, and we would love to to help set up a meeting with the safe folks and we can walk you through the course certification. Awesome. Um, and you know, both of their, uh, both of your emails are on the screen, so this is great. Um, so we have another uh, question. This one is on uh, naturally uh, occurring affordable housing. Uh, this person is asking if these programs work for naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and then they have a second question that is, uh, do these programs have an assessment tool um, for uh, multi that multifamily housing programs could use to look at health and energy efficiency together? Uh, those are two good questions. So the easy answer is first, uh, and no, they won't work with naturally occurring affordable uh, properties. We do require that 60% of the units be restricted uh, at, afford at uh, rent levels that are affordable uh, to people making very low incomes. Uh, we did that for a very specific reason and that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were targeting the program to folks that, um, where we knew there was affordable housing being provided. Uh, and we knew that the, these folks were, you know, the number one way in which you, in which you can create health uh, for low income uh, individuals is to ensure that they're not paying more than 30% of their income per rent. I think it's important. We felt it was important to keep that in mind. And so, you know, having those uh, rent and income uh, restrictions in place was, was critical for the property. Now we are looking at on the active design uh, component, uh, the possibility of uh, expanding the program to include more mixed income properties, but we would still require that at least a certain percentage of those units be restricted uh, at affordable rent levels. Um, in terms of, you know, really looking at the um, looking at the performance and the interconnectedness between uh, energy efficiency and health. Um, I can let Rachel speak to that a little bit more, but that is definitely something that we're interested in and we want to be able to track and measure over time. But right now the program's pretty pretty new and it's it's really hard to it's it's really we we, we don't have any conclusions to draw yet from from the program. It's, it's only been in existence for you know, less than 18 months. Yeah, so I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. What we have seen in actually the first property that did the Healthy Housing Rewards Healthy Design Pathway, um, qualifying with the Fitwell certification, is that, as Bob talked about before, they layered on not only the Healthy Housing Rewards Program, but also Fannie Mae's Green Rewards Program. So we recognize that properties are not thinking about energy efficiency and um, you know, improving the indoor quality and, and healthy design of properties kind of in, in isolation. It is very much often you know, part of the same, same project, right? Um, I think there is some overlap between you know, what, there's certainly health-related benefits to some of the energy efficiency improvements that properties can do through our green rewards program and then kind of in a larger rehab where you're considering energy efficiency water efficiency you know just general renovation of, of units and healthy design uh, you know those those go hand in hand what i would encourage everyone to do is is take a look at the fitwell standard they actually have very user-friendly kind of checklist of what components what measures are actually required to get um, to the FitWell certification. So if you go to the website, these slides will be sent out, but it's fitwell.org slash resources, and you can download for free uh, their multifamily scorecard and actually dig in and see what types of improvements they're uh, incentivizing through the certification. Great, helpful. Should, the Fitball website should be um, up on the up on the screen now. Uh, awesome, thank you. Uh, so uh, I have another uh, 
th this question, which is kind of a, a bit of a scenario. So let me give me a moment to read it out. Um, but it says, we have been operating a property with uh, RSV since the mid 90s where the RSV and NNW programs are funded through operating revenue. Uh, HUD rent increases have not kept up with the operating costs of these two amenities. And today we find the property in a position where it's unable to fund a required repayment uh, of a flex sub loan. And do you believe these two programs fit refinancing needs? Would fit the refinancing needs? That's a tough question to answer with the information that we have. I, I would encourage um, uh, whoever answered that question to reach out to myself or Rachel, and we can talk about it offline and get some more details on it. Great. All right. Uh, someone is asking, do you envision services funds to support part-time nursing support? I don't think that's prohibited, Rachel, is it? It's not prohibited. I will say that from what I understand from the stewards of affordable housing who are operating the certification, generally all of these properties are going to have a resident services coordinator on staff to really organize the services component to connect to the resources in the existing community. We're certainly not barring, you know, having a, a nurse on staff. I mean, that's that would um, very much be fair game, but I think it would be kind of in conjunction with having a resident services coordinator on staff. Great. Uh, so what, what is the threshold for what constitutes affordable for very low income? Sure, it's 60% uh, AMI, 60% of your area median income or below. Um, and, uh, that we're requiring that 60% of those units be affordable to folks at 60% AMI or below. Great, thank you. Uh, and so I know that, that in the presentation you talked a bit about kind of the look ahead for the for the two programs. I'm wondering if you um, if there are kind of next steps that you have, um, or if you're you know it's, things are kind of set and now you're just run, you know continuing to run the program and, and see where um, kind of Kind of what the yeah, I think are. for us right now, you know, we've we've spent a lot of time we spent a lot of time developing the program, working with our third party um, certification providers, and you know, over the last year, we've really been focused on um, doing deals, and I think that's you know that's why we did this, right? We want to make sure that we're putting financing out that supports these services. So I think you know, in the in the very short term. Our goal is to continue to build examples like we showed you today, right? So the more deals that we can do like Common Bond, the more deals we can we can do like Amani Place, the better. We'll learn from those deals. It gives us the opportunity to sort of learn how to improve the program, make tweaks uh, to make it better over time. That's sort of how we learn is by doing. And, uh, and also start building up a kind of a, a wealth of best practices that we can continue to provide uh, back to the community, uh, so that we can so that we can all learn together, um, and and hopefully, you know, over the next 24 months, you know, we'll be able to build up build up a pretty good um, uh, number of deals where we can look back and learn on. That that's the goal. To be honest with you, is to continue to grow the program, learn from it, um, and get more services provided at these properties. Great, and, and can you maybe speak to, cause I know there's, so someone else is also asking about Tennessee. I mean, maybe you can speak to kind of geographically where the, the programs are and, you know, if that's just by nature of, of where you've been able to partner up with folks. Um, yeah, so, you know, right, I mean, you know, if we'll do business in, in all 50 states, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, you know, any, any part of the United States will finance a deal there. Um, I think healthy housing, off the top of my head, uh, we've done deals in California for healthy housing, uh, New Jersey, um, Florida, Minnesota, and, um, and another deal in Minnesota, uh, a couple of deals in Minnesota, and then there's one more that escapes my attention, but, you know, it doesn't really matter which state you're from or where you're at. I think as, as long as, 
um, you know, you can get the right certification uh, and the deal pencils out, um, then then we can then we can do it. And you you had mentioned that you know, based off of of, of you know in, in each individual community, it kind of um, changes how you are approaching the the deal and everything. I mean, are there have you found with with the number of um, different states that you're working in or different areas that you're working in that there have been barriers particular to certain or or, or you know maybe not barriers but but challenges um, particular to certain areas um, or are, are you know or have you seen kind of uh, trends as to, as to um, yeah I mean I think you know I, I mean you know obviously you know the the most common commonly used phrase in affordable housing or commonly used two words in affordable housing are it depends right so it really does depend on on the property and the location but generally speaking uh, there is typically a difference in resident services based on whether or not you're in an urban area or a rural area. So if you're in an urban area that, that is close to a lot of community services, then typically, you know, the property needs someone to help coordinate those services and make sure that, you know, they're reaching out to the community health center, uh, to the local school, to all these different programs and coordinating those services. Uh, whereas in a rural market or an urban market that's very underserved, uh, a lot of times you have to kind of bring those services in-house um, or find other ways to address that. So I think there definitely is a, a kind of a, a rural-urban divide and, and also within the urban there's, you know, an underserved neighborhood um, differential as well. Thank you. Um, I, so we, that, that seems to be, um, most all of the questions and I take it back because someone just uh, answered another. Um, so if people do have any more questions that they'd like uh, answered, you know, uh, please, please submit now. Um, so I have another question that just came in. Um, are there any requirements or provisions of the loans that encourage property owners to maintain their property? Um. Yeah, I mean, um, yes, we, um, you know, we, in order for the property to be a, you know, so, so, so the, trying to figure out the right way to answer the question is, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're, we provide the interest rate to the borrower. Um, we're assuming that borrower is going to be owning that property for the life of the loan. Uh, if the property is sold and the loan is assumed, um, we have the, you know, we have to approve that loan assumption. And so, you know, we would want to make sure that um, not only are the affordability, affordable restrictions remain in place as per the LURA, but that also that the resident services continue to be provided. Great, thank you. Um, so I think that that, um, as far as the questions are concerned, um, will about do it. I would like to just for you know both Bob and, and Rachel, there are a number of people in the in the uh, question chat box that have uh, uh, not submitted questions, but rather kind of uh, um, you know uh, praise for for the program. So you know, I have someone who's saying they're a service coordinator for a HUD 202 um, for the elderly, and you know they really appreciate the uh, the presentation and the work that you're doing and um, someone else who, who has said that, you know, they applaud the work and creativity. They have a uh, resident uh, services program that has uh, had significant qualitative and quantitative impacts on residents, but they struggle every year to fund the program as services have not been an eligible line item in the operating budget. Um, so, you know, there are uh, people who are tuning in are, are, are pretty, uh, it seems, seems to be pretty excited um, and interested in the program. And, and, you know, we're very grateful for, for the two of you being on with us. Um, and, and, and sharing kind of the work that you're all doing and, and the work that you're continuing to do. Um, so before I, I just have a, a kind of closing announcement uh, separate from, from a webinar and discussion, I just wanna, you know, if, if the two of you have um, any other uh, things that you wanna add uh, to the conversation, um, you know, uh, I wanna give you the space to do that now. Well, I'll let, I'll let Rachel uh, take the last word uh, since she um, does a significant amount of work on the program, but all I would say is that this is something that's very important to us. Um, it's also not a perfect program because it's new. 
uh, and over the, you know, we, like I said, we learn by doing. And so the more that we do, uh, the more lessons we're going to learn and, and the better the product we get. And so we're, we're looking forward to continuing to, to improve it uh, and do more deals in the years to come. I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're really excited about this program as well. And we love hearing from folks who are, you know, working on uh, resident services in the field and kind of answering questions about the program, uh, hearing from you either with questions or things that you're confused about with the program. So honestly, please do reach out to us uh, and we can, we are happy to have those conversations. And thanks very much for the opportunity to present this today. Of course, all right. Well, thank you both for, for presenting with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, and, and people, you know, tuning in also to, to, to really appreciate it as well. So thank you for the time. Um, I will just end with one um, note on behalf of the Restoring Neighborhoods uh, Task Force. Um, we are always looking for good examples of community development related work um, as it intersects with uh, issues such as uh, health, um, you know, environment, transportation, and more. So, so for those who are tuning in, who might um, work for an organization or know of, of work from an organization that you know you think is a great example of uh, uh, this kind of work um, that we've just heard about today, uh, please let me know at npark at nhc.org. Um, happy to to field those uh, thoughts and, and questions as well. Um, so again, thank you to everyone who tuned in uh, today. We appreciate your time and that you spent your afternoon with us. Um, and we look forward to having you at the next webinar. Thanks everyone.